So good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin, and uh, welcome to this morning's Thyroid Journal Club. It's really a pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Angela Leung, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at UCLA David uh, Geffen School of Medicine. Uh, she's an endocrinologist at both UCLA and the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System. A um, little bit of background on Angela. She completed her internal medicine residency and endocrinology fellowship in Boston at uh, Boston University and um, Boston Medical Center. Um, she also studied um, at the Boston University School of Public Health, where she obtained a master's degree in epidemiology. Um, her particular interests rely, re, are in um, thyroidology, uh, where she both um, serves as a clinician and an investigator, and um, her particular interests have to do with um, iodine status, um, uh, environmental thyroid toxins, um, toxicants, and maternal child thyroid health. Um, she is on the board of directors of the ATA and is editor-in-chief of Clinical Thyroidology. Um, and so it's really a pleasure to have her present a really interesting um, article that was published recently. Um, it's also a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Eric Alexander, who is chief of the thyroid section, Division of Endocrinology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is a professor of medicine and also associate dean for medical education at Harvard Medical School. Um, Eric really needs no introduction. He's widely published um, in the field um, with a major interest in thyroidology. He has been active in the ATA and um, has been uh, one of the guideline co-chairs uh, for the most recent clinical guidelines um, uh, related to detection of thyroid illness during pregnancy and postpartum. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, turn the program over to Angela. I just want to um, re uh, advise everyone that there is a questions tab. If you have questions, we're going to try to get to them um, at the end of this uh, session. So please feel free to uh, go ahead and register those, and we're going to leave some time at the very end to try to get to them. Uh, so welcome, everybody. And Angela, thank you again for getting up. Uh, so early in the morning out on the West Coast to participate here. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Erkin and the meeting organizers, everyone at Thank for just the, the nice opportunity to present uh, this paper. Um, and so with that, let's get started. Uh, my disclosures, again, as Dr. Erkin mentioned, I am uh, on the board of directors and I'm the clinical thyroidology editor-in-chief of the ATA. Uh, I also serve on the thyroid advisory board for Medscape. So uh, let's begin with a case. This is our 38-year-old male who was found to have an incidental thyroid nodule on the ultrasound. The thyroid nodule is as described as a single solid and hypoechoic nodule measuring um, 0 0.8 by 0 0.7 by uh, 0 0.9 centimeters with smooth margins and the presence uh, of uh, echogenic foci. The patient underwent FNA biopsy, which was reported as Bethesda class 6 malignant. Your patient is worried since he has two close friends that suffer from thyroid cancer, each presenting a very different course of disease. So before making decisions on treatment options, you explain that current research shows that either A, thyroid cancer incidence rates are rising. However, mortality uh, for thyroid, uh, thyroid cancer-specific mortality remains low. Uh, B, both of these are rising. C, thyroid cancer incidences uh, are in decline, but thyroid specific mortality is rising. Or D, both of these are in decline. So with that, uh, please go ahead and vote in the poll. And all right, and then I'm gonna just go on. Oh, sorry. Let me. Should I? Uh, should I share this result? These results. Everybody can see those, Angela. So we can definitely go right into your presentation here. Thank you. 
All right, so to begin, um, these are data uh, showing the global trends in thyroid cancer over the last several decades across the spectrum of various countries in the world. It's notable um, of the large rise uh, in South Korea starting around the time of 1999, which is when the country began their universal national um, screening program for thyroid cancer. Um, so the, the solid bars in each of the countries are those across the different decades in which uh, those are the, the observed instances and the dotted lines are the corresponding time periods uh, against those which are expected according to modeling. And you can see that South Korea really leads the, the race in this regard, uh, really as a result uh, of that national screening program which began in 1999. And in fact, the incidence in South Korea is about eightfold that of the United States and about tenfold that of the global incidence rates overall. Um, and it's just really remarkable that thyroid cancer in South Korea as a country is the number one diagnosis of all cancers, uh, whereas in the United States, for example, it is number 12. Um, and so a little bit more background, what are some possible reasons for increasing incidence of thyroid cancer? Certainly we talked about overdiagnosis, which you know suggests that uh, a lot of folks are just getting uh, screening from either dedicated programs uh, with thyroid ultrasounds in everybody, or just uh, there's a lot of incidental use of uh, CAT scans and other sorts of imaging modalities, which happen to pick up thyroid nodules. Or number two, there could there be a real biological uh, etiology to this rising incidence of thyroid cancer. And probably if that is true, it's probably from a, a, a multifactorial basis. So a variety of environmental insults, of thyroid autoimmunity, of changes in iodine nutrition, uh, of obesity, and other factors. Lots of folks um, have written about many of these, these specific factors. So it's unclear whether or not sort of this growing, uh, rising trend of cancer incidence in thyroid cancer is associated with also a concurrent trend in deaths, so thyroid cancer's related mortality. So in order to uh, study that a little further, there have been a, a few seminal articles. Um, I begin with this one by uh, Louise Davies and Welch, uh, published in JAMA 2006. This was data taken from SEER. Uh, so SEER is a national database um, from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and in SEER 9, about 10% of the US population nationwide was captured. Um, and it spans over a course of nearly 30 years, as you can see, um, and there were uh, concurrent uh, mortality data that were also taken from the same period. And so investigators over the years have looked at both incidence of thyroid cancer as well as mortality. And you can see if you're on the screen that the incidence of thyroid cancer between you know, the beginning and end of this 30 year period grew about two and a half fold. Uh, and the mortality rate stayed very stably, uh, same at about 0 0.5 per 100,000 folks, um, which was not statistically significant. Um, more recently, Lim et al. Uh, in JAMA 2017 also looked at SEER 9 data, but from a different time period. So 1974 to 2013. So now a different period of about 40 years. Uh, and the same uh, types of uh, trends uh, uh, and values, results were, were calculated uh, from this paper, but in a different way. So incidence was calculated as annual percent change, meaning uh, what is the speed of change uh, throughout this, this 40 year period? And it was about 3.6% overall uh, across the entire span of the 40 years. Uh, concurrently, the annual incidence-based mortality change was about 1.1%, which sounds low, but it was statistically significant in the series. So what we attempted to do was now look uh, and turn to another cohort, um, trying to really answer this question of whether or not there's a rising trend in death rate. Uh, from thyroid cancer. And we use the California Cancer Registry, my, uh, the registry in my home state. Um, and this is a, an, a program, statewide program by the California Department of Public Health. Uh, it's a mandated statewide population-based cancer registry. So all of the, the hospitals and uh, clinics and everything else in the state are mandated to report, which includes all academic centers, all small hospitals, even all VA hospitals. Uh, and this is all types of thyroid cancer that were captured across a 17 year period, which was the full uh, span of the time period available, analyzed for this study. 
let's review the statistical analyses that, that were done. Um, so similar to the first two papers that I just presented, uh, we also tried to calculate overall incidence and overall incidence-based mortality over the full study period. Because we had 17 years of data, uh, we thought it was important to calculate the annual incidences um, uh, for, for both of these, these metrics. Uh, and so to do that, we need a de denominator. Uh, and to do that, we used um, census data. Um, so the total California population as well as death rate uh, were taken from the sources. Uh, and all of the percentages uh, that we see were age adjusted to the 2000 California census population expressed per 100,000 person years. It's important when we do these sort of studies that we standardize um, the denominator to a specific point in time. So, you know, at the beginning of the time period, 2000 was what we chose in order to mitigate uh, and minimize any um, changes in technology or advances in thyroid cancer that would have taken place over the 17 years. Lastly, we also uh, uh, reported trends in overall incidence and incidence-based mortality. So not just the annual incidences uh, of these two um, metrics over the 17 years, but really their change of the change. So the first is probably the speed, you know, something that we can ascribe to like the speed of a car versus the second trends would be the acceleration or deceleration, the velocity that's changing. Um, and so that's expressed as an average annual percent change, the APC. And I'll uh, explain more over that uh, in the next slide. Um, and these are our subject demographics. This is uh, the overall thyroid cancer incidence in California uh, from 2000 to 2017. The median age of her cohort was 50 years with a range of 38 to 61 years. And you can see that uh, the case number load was nearly 70,000 folks, uh, primarily male, uh, Caucasian, non-Hispanic, uh, when we look at age, it was fairly evenly spread um, throughout sort of the middle age ranges. Uh, by and large, uh, as we would expect for all thyroid cancer studies, uh, papillary thyroid cancer made up the bulk uh, of all types of diagnoses. And most of these cancers were localized, about 60% worth uh, or so. When we look at the sizes of the papillary uh, thyroid cancers, uh, it was interesting that they were very evenly split, spread across uh, you know, the, the span of the size ranges. So anywhere from less than one to one to two to two to four, less so um, were those uh, seen in greater than four uh, centimeters. And so these are now just pictorial data um, showing similarly what we what we just discussed. Um, these are now, again, thyroid cancer incidences in California. On the left side in the blue box is our overall uh, thyroid cancer incidence. Um, and you can see that uh, here on the very top, it is led by the papillary thyroid cancer diagnoses. In panel B in the middle, when we look uh, at the papillary thyroid cancer incidences by tumor stage, the vast majority are, the, are those which are localized here on the very top. And then at the very end here, um, when we look at thyroid cancer incidence by tumor size, it is again, fairly evenly split, um, oops, uh, across uh, the span of uh, tumor sizes as shown. All right, so um, this is probably the most important slide uh, out of uh, all of our results. So let me just take a minute to explain. Um, here, uh, there are several axes. There are perhaps three different axes. So on the left, we see the annual percent change. Um, this is the change in uh, the incidence of thyroid cancer, of the papillary thyroid cancers. So anything positive, anything above zero on the y-axis, uh, indicates a growing incidence over time. And then on the x-axis uh, are the tumors stratified by the sizes, anywhere from zero to up to, let's say, five. Um, and you can see the vast majority are you know, skewed toward the left, so anywhere in the 0 0.5 to 3 centimeter range. And then the third axis uh, is shown on the top right, which is uh, how many number of papillary thyroid cancer diagnoses were present per 1 million in the state of California. And again, you can see vast majority, the predominance uh, were those in the, the lower uh, range sizes. So uh, again, overall, what this shows is the annual percent change 
um, across the entire study period, we can say that on the y-axis is averaging about 4% uh, as an annual percent change, as an APC. If we now turn to mortality, the second metric that I just mentioned, um, these are those data. So who really died uh, in this cohort um, over that time period? There are about 2,500 deaths overall. Uh, the vast majority of them were women um, and Caucasian and non-Hispanic folks. Um, the age breakdown uh, primarily were those uh, in ages 60 to 79 years um, who died, primarily those with papillary thyroid cancer, but, but not by a long shot, 45%. Um, and it was really those with distant disease, 56% um, made up those, those folks. Uh, and it was really the large papillary thyroid cancers. So 42% uh, with those over four centimeters. Um, and if we want to see these data in a more graphical view, um, these are the supplemental uh, tables from the paper. Uh, uh, figures from the table, from the paper. So overall, uh, on the right, we can see in the black uh, box that the uh, relative mortality over the 17-year period was 1.7% per year. That's an average across the entire span. And if we break that down into which tumor types were involved, up on top, we can see it was anaplastic at 3.5% per year, followed by papillary 2.3% per year. The follicular thyroid cancers are mostly stable, and then the medullaries actually saw a decrease. But what's important to realize here and take away is that overall that 1.7% per year is positive and it's statistically significant. So people were dying from thyroid cancer over this time period in a statistically significant way. If we then break it down by gender, uh, males um, grew at a rate of 2.7% per year in terms of death rate, while uh, for females there was no change, statistically significantly so. And then uh, if we look at the uh, type of disease, uh, most of it was regional, so 6.0% followed by um, uh, distant, which was a little bit negative overall, and then localized, which was 4.1%. Uh, all right. And then finally, uh, if we look at tumor sizes, um, uh, overall, it was 1 to 2%. One, the, the papillary thyroid cancers, which were 1 to 2 centimeters at 5.1%, followed by those which were 2.4 centimeters, and then lastly by 4 centimeters, but all of which were statistically significant. So. In, essentially, in other words, papillary thyroid cancers of all sizes um, and deaths from them grew uh, over this time period. So just to summarize these parts of the results, um, that first bubble plot showed that the uh, average incidence of thyroid cancer grew at about 4%, and this is irrespective of uh, a variety of things as we substratified by, as you can see there. And importantly, it actually captures the more rare subtypes, so anaplastic cancers, for example, as well as papillary thyroid cancers over four centimeters, so it really captures the wide spectrum. Um, if we look at uh, the overall average um, annual percent change of thyroid cancer incidences over this time um, for mortality, that was statistically significant at 1.7%. Uh, and again, it was more pronounced and significant for those who were men uh, with papillary, uh, those with advanced stage PTC, and uh, more pronounced in older patients, so ages 60 to 79 years. And so uh, we appreciated this, this commentary by Dr. Vigneri uh, and colleagues in the same issue as our study, which you know just spoke a little bit about perhaps why, oops, uh, is thyroid cancer increasing over this time period? Um, so for example, um, we talked about uh, increased exposure to radiation, perhaps, uh, changes in dietary iodine intake. Uh, there are environmental exposures like nitrates that are uh, purported to be uh, uh, an insult. And then in our state of California, certainly there's a, a big agricultural industry uh, and there's thousands of chemicals, many with unknown uh, properties and carcinogen carcinogenicity. So for example, heavy metals uh, might be uh, incriminated. Uh, all of these are sort of you know, um, not not very well proven, uh, and this is why we need to sort of study uh, these trends. Um, it's important to also just uh, talk about certain biases uh, when we talk about epidemiologic data, uh, and there is this 
this phenomenon of stage migration. It's also called the Will Rogers effect. It's been written about, um, for example, in, in this article from the New England Journal from the 1985 uh, uh, era. Um, and this is when, um, as a result of advances in thyroid cancer, and certainly thyroid cancer has seen a lot of advances uh, over the last few decades, um, that uh, folks who were previously cast, classified as, you know, having sort of a good cancer, and so they had a good stage back in perhaps the 1980s or 90s, now because of all the, the, the data uh, and more sensitive assays and more uh, sensitive imaging that we have, they would be they would be assigned a bad stage. So this is a, a migration and upward a titration of stage uh, that perhaps may be at play um, throughout the years. And that's really why it's important to standardize everybody to the beginning uh, of the period. And that's what we did uh, for the year 2000. Strength um, is that the cohort, well, we believe is culturally diverse in a very large state. Um, you know, California is the most populous US, US state um, and it actually has a larger population uh, surpassing that of even the countries of Canada or Australia. Uh, we have the third largest U.S. state uh, by land mass. Um, and the size of the cohort, I we believe, is, is fairly reasonable. Um, nearly 70,000 individuals were studied. Um, and because of, of the California Cancer Registry, which is a mandated statewide registry, this data set is linked to all sorts of hospital data, um, demographics, diagnostic treatment outcomes, et cetera. Um, and again, all rates were age adjusted to the beginning uh, of, the, of the, the study period to minimize for stage migration. Um, it's also important just to talk about attribution bias very quickly. Um, the use of incidence-based mortality uh, really ensures that the people who um, you know, had growing incidences of thyroid cancer were sort of the same folks that had deaths uh, in the time period. So attribution bias is when um, we see death, ra death rates that are perhaps attributed to thyroid cancer, but really the biological um, reason for the death is not due to thyroid cancer. It's perhaps just listed in the medical record. Uh, and then limitations, um, you know, we can argue that the relatively short follow-up period may be at play and it be, be a factor here. Um, certainly, uh, the folks who were enrolled at the very beginning of the study period in the two, early 2000s would have much, much longer time. But toward the end, you know, the folks uh, in the mid-2000s, 2015 or so, they only had about two years of follow-up data. Um, so to account for that, we did um, stratify for time to death. Uh, from the time of the initial diagnosis to minimize uh, that potential bias. Uh, there were a small number of cases in some of the subsets as we can have, we, we saw, um, but that would be sort of true for any sort of large thyroid cancer data set. Um, there were possible errors, obviously, that we can ascribe uh, for those who were uh, enrolled in the very last year of the study, so 2017, due to delayed reporting from, from the, the healthcare institutions to the registry. And of course, there's likely some heterogeneity and in, you know, individual uh, practice styles, what, what procedures are, are available at the local level, socioeconomic conditions, et cetera, which uh, would have lended some heterogeneity. But in conclusion, um, I'm glad to report uh, that the, these data show um, that from the statewide uh, cancer registry, the incidence of thyroid cancer really supports the previous data uh, that thyroid cancer incidence is increasing. And this phenomenon is not restricted necessarily to those very small papillary thyroid cancers, um, as has been written about quite extensively. Uh, and that rising incidence uh, of thyroid cancer of all sizes, and when we saw that 1.7% statistically significant mortality rate. Uh, this was um, seen across uh, overall in, in the entire data set, but specifically those in men and those with uh, larger tumors. And this really suggests that there's a true increase in the biological uh, disease uh, specific death rate. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm just gonna share my screen now. And hopefully you all can see that as well as see myself. Um, it's a pleasure to be the discussant on this journal club. My name's Eric Alexander, <clears throat> as uh, Dr. Erkin had mentioned early on. Uh, and as I approach um, the discussant role in the journal club, um, I see my job kind of as to talk through almost kind of uh, self-reflection as to how I would read the article and the questions I would be asking uh, 
Uh, and so for those who perhaps are more junior trainees, it's an insight into how I would be thinking about writing an article or doing the research. Um, and those, I guess, more senior, it's a little bit more at least how I see these data translating into clinical practice. Uh, and so I'll walk through this kind of step by step, starting uh, with the background and, and perspective to this and repeating a lot of what Dr. Liang has recently uh, mentioned. But when I, I think about any manuscript, I, I think about the key to it first is, is it really hitting a point that we all want to know about? Is it kind of finding that unanswered question? And the key uh, to this manuscript uh, is indeed to really uh, clarify that duality of what uh, we're looking at, which is the incidence of cancer versus the incidence-based uh, mortality from the cancer. And as uh, Dr. Leung had mentioned, for the last two to three decades, kind of setting the stage for why this manuscript is important, we as a community uh, of endocrinologists, endocrine surgeons, everyone dealing with this illness, have acknowledged that there's been an overdiagnosis problem. Uh, and that really has captured, I think, all of our attention. It has certainly impacted guidelines. Uh, it makes sense because we've increased cross-sectional imaging, routine ultrasound, uh, kind of a access and awareness of, of nodules. Uh, and so that has led to a number of different changes. I think we're all aware that we're doing far more limited surgeries of the thyroid. We've defined a new low-risk kind of NIFT-P entity that's kind of a low-risk malignancy. We certainly are using less radioiodine. So that's very much in front of us. And in fact, the book would kind of be closed that we just had overdiagnosed and look at South Korea, et cetera. Um, and so what's unique here though, yeah, and what's relevant here is that it's an active issue, that there had been this question that perhaps it's not just the overdiagnosis of small volume indolent disease, but uh, could there be something else? Why um, have we seen these initial kind of smoldering questions that perhaps there's more large volume disease? And in particular, when you look at this endpoint of disease related mortality, that shouldn't relate to just in incidentally detected small illness. So where this paper I think hits the sweet spot and clearly kind of labels its relevance, um, and certainly relevance for me is it's asking this question, could there be both overdiagnosis of, of small disease, but also something else causing an increase in clinically relevant disease? And that's kind of the starting point uh, that I think is so important. Well, how would you answer that question is what would go through my mind next. Um, how would you answer the question, could there be both, right? Overdiagnosis and a rising incidence of higher risk disease. Well, um, if you kind of reflect on this and step back, I would argue there's probably two ideal options. Um, one is that you would lead with a clear hypothesis that could explain both. And then you would think of a study method that could prove or disprove this, um, perhaps uh, working around that hypothesis in two groups that were exposed or not exposed, et cetera. So we have a leading kind of reason for why overdiagnosis is occurring. And we think that's just increased detection, right? But we don't really have, um, a leading hypothesis for this higher risk disease. So that, that's probably not uh, doable. The second ideal option is you would kind of start yourself perhaps a prospective cohort study of long duration with uh, minimal sample bias, but in which you have really control of this data set and this, um, this group of individuals. And that would be kind of the process you've seen, we've all seen take forward uh, in terms of like nurses health study, Framingham heart study, physicians health study. These are kind of those prospective cohort large studies, very large numbers, very large retention, very consistent follow-up testing, but that just wasn't doable in this setting. We didn't have the ability, it would be very hard, it'd be very costly to do. Um, so uh, the setting for this is the next best option is gonna kind of be this large uh, 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 analysis of a retrospective registry. And like uh, we've seen with SEER or the National Death Data, Medicare Data, or in this case, the California Cancer Registry. So at least in my mind, it sets the stage that um, it's the best we can do. It's really still a very good analysis here. Um, and uh, and it's, it's the best to, I think, give us kind of the next step of where we go with this. So I'm gonna repeat a little bit of what Dr. Leung has uh, said. So when I kind of put this together now, I, I say in my head, well, this is a retrospective analysis of all thyroid cancers reported to this registry. And as she pointed out, what I think is worth noting here is the mandatory cancer reporting system uh, amongst all healthcare institutions in the state. So that's really important to understand how the registry is put together, a very strong attribute then to 
uh, presuming that the data analysis speaks to truth, essentially. But when you search databases in a retrospective manner, uh, you also have to think, how is that done? And we typically will be using ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes. We'll also be looking at other codes that can represent extent of disease. Um, and these are good, but also realize that many different, well, especially when we deal with ICD-10, that there's many different codes that can kind of all clump into the same general illness. And as we'll talk about here at the bottom of the slide in a second, you know, be always alert, or at least I'm always thinking to myself, what are the other drivers of why people code? Uh, and there are many different drivers, right? There's drivers from an insurance standpoint, there's drivers from a payer standpoint, and you just always wanna be um, thoughtful as to, could those ever be driving a different agenda than just, um, than just what we're seeing? But in general, this is a, a good approach. It's the best we have, and it's just kind of asking myself, where are always the little areas to be um, questioning or pushing the limit a little bit? And then you, of course, link the data to mortality. And as Dr. Leung went, that's through various other databases. And so there's a linkage issue, um, but generally that's very doable. So I, I say all of this because the leading question for me for database work is realizing that when it's a retrospective analysis of a database you're tapping into, um, you don't really ever have the chance to independently validate a subset. So you can't go and look at the group from Hospital um, X and the primary records to really understand if the way it was entered into a system is um, exactly what you were assuming. Um, instead, you're kind of assuming that uh, it's accurate. And, uh, and the question, as I mentioned before, can clinical care choices be influenced by factors beyond just the doctor-patient uh, you know, care decisions? So um, when I look at a large database analysis to get an idea if it's logical, the first thing I do is I, I think to myself, you know, it seems like the, the extent of this database is super. Does it fit with my experience? Oh, and this is where then I move into the tables. And I think the authors did a super job of being very transparent. And uh, data, I think uh, database analyses like this do require a lot of kind of data in the tables uh, to be put into the journal article. And so this is the full table one. Uh, and the reason I put it up here is to, is to acknowledge that when I first approached it, uh, it takes time to walk through each. Uh, and I start on kind of the left in the large columns here, thyroid cancer. And what I'm doing is I'm working my way down. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'll just describe. So if I'm looking down thyroid cancer incidents right now, and I'm asking myself, well, what's the gender makeup here that's being reported? Well, it's 76% females. And the answer is yes, that's exactly what I would expect to see, right? Thyroid cancer is a gender specific illness. Uh, and in fact, in the same time, if I move to the right and I look at incidence-based mortality, I'm looking at the gender makeup and I note, hmm, there's an interesting strong uptick here in males now disproportionately dying from thyroid cancer. Does that make sense? The answer is yes. Um, I mean, staging systems developed over the many past decades have constantly noted that males seem to do worse, especially older males. So I like this kind of internal check that what I'm seeing from the database data that were obtained that will come to the results and define the results fit with kind of what I expect. And I would think that anyone who critically reads it would want to do the same working your way down through all the different points. I like to see that the majority of cancers are papillary. That's exactly what we would expect. And as Dr. Leung mentioned, when I look at incidence-based mortality, well, it turns out it's more the anaplastic and other types, the higher risk malignancies that are also associated with mortality, that fits. Um, but there are some other you know, flags to note. When I get to the bottom of this slide, uh, when I look at papillary carcinoma, <clears throat> which is driving the database numbers, it is notable that 30%, almost a third of the cases being reported are sub-centimeter. Um, and when we go back to even 2000, there's never been a clinical recommendation to biopsy nodules under one centimeter. Um, so it raises questions. Why are those there? Are they incidental? How do we think about that? And even when I move over to incident rate-based uh, mortality, uh, I still kind of roll my eyes a little and think that's you know 4% of mortality related to sub-centimeter papillary carcinoma, 7% to cancers between one and two centimeters. It's possible. Um, it's just that that caught my eye as being perhaps a little higher than I would see. So uh, it doesn't discount any data. It's just how I kind of walk through a table. 
And so that's kind of what I was getting at. So in this study, uh, does it fit with my expectations? It does. The high female proportions, that papillary is the most common, the deaths are in older individuals. Um, but again, note some of the uncertainties that should catch your eye as well. The median diagnosis, a little young, especially if we're dealing with older people um, in the mortality columns. Uh, the majority uh, of the papillaries, or at least a large proportion, excuse me, are small. Um, and then this question that some of the deaths are related to just very localized disease, and we'd have to think through, is that what you typically see in your practice? So that's then what's leading me then to the kind of meat of this article. When I then look at figure one, I, I really think it's the most important of the um, it's the most important of the uh, pieces of data, the the results. And I think in situations like this, a, a picture does really paint a thousand words, uh, because you look at each of the uh, different um, uh, columns here, A, B, and C, and you begin to see uh, very interesting trends, right? That over the course of time, this is driven primarily by papillary carcinoma, but you can even note in this kind of figure 1A here that there does appear to be a little increased in this gray line. I believe that's anaplastic. Um, and when I go over to 1C in particular, I think that is the crux, that it, there is small disease that is increasing, but there's also large disease that is increasing, and we need to um, realize that and think about that as well. That's what we were kind of after with the, the authors were after in terms of their uh, starting point. So yeah, that rise in cancer, I think we, we did it. I think what we can say is when we've looked at the data, it clarifies the findings that the rise in incidence is driven primarily by papillary carcinoma, uh, maybe a little bit of anaplastic. The rise in incidence is also driven um, or primarily by a papillary carcinoma um, that is localized. This does support an overdiagnosis, overdetection hypothesis. So that fits with everything that's been said for 20 years, and that's what we want to see. It, it makes sense. But it's that figure 1C that demonstrates that a rise in all tumor sizes, including those that are large, and that supports really the hypothesis that we're witnessing something else uh, in parallel, right? That there's also a rise in more aggressive disease. And I think that's critical and was kind of set up with that very nice background um, in the article. So after some deep analysis of the data, what do the data really tell us? Well, yes, it supports kind of both, um, that there's a, an overdiagnosis, but there's also something else going on with higher risk disease. And that this high risk disease appears to lie on this papillary to anaplastic spectrum. Well, that kind of a continuum or correlate seems to make sense, right? That we believe both papillary and anaplastic are follicular cell based tumors. Uh, and in fact, most anaplastics, if you look histologically, arise from a papillary carcinoma, likely with a second or third mutational hit. Um, and so to see that kind of uh, spectrum and that continuum is, is making logical kind of hypothetical sense. But what I'll, I'll note here to kind of uh, finish up the last five minutes is we still don't really know why this latter problem is occurring. Why is that higher risk disease going up? And if you don't know why it's happening, then you don't really know how to address it is, is the issue. So um, I say all of that because a really good discussion should acknowledge the points, those points, postulate some answers, tell us kind of where we're going. Um, and I think the authors do a terrific job on this. Uh, we see both, you know, I'm just quoting here, they see both a rise in small volume cancer, but also the large volume cancer that fits into this broader spectrum of published data. And where they go with it, which I think is so critical, um, is that they do, they are willing to say, we don't understand why this is happening, at least for the large volume disease, but let's postulate some ideas uh, for perhaps why it's happening. Those environmental questions, the dietary issues, change in genetics to cancer, uh, and acknowledging it's dynamic as well, that perhaps um, we don't want to take this as a truism for all the time, but we're watching how various practice patterns can change uh, or impact of new recommendations. So as, as the kind of uh, discussant of the article, I would just have the audience take a look at the length of the discussion. If you haven't read the paper yet, um, or if you have, just go back and you'll notice that it's a longer discussion than most. It's probably two to three pages. Um, but I think that's absolutely appropriate because I think that's what the authors needed to do is not only show the interesting data, but kind of acknowledge, yeah, this is the problem of a large retrospective database analysis is we need to now as a community also ask why is this happening and kind of guide that next step. And I think they did that really nicely. So um, my conclusion and the joy of just being the discussant uh, and celebrating a great amount of work of Dr. Leung and her colleagues 
um, is to just walk through again how I read it and the points I take out, which is I think whenever you're looking at the background and perspective, you want to really ask are these authors building on a current and important issue and how are their data pushing that forward? Um, and they certainly did. Uh, you understood my, at least my thought on the complexities of interpreting large database analyses. Um, I think clarifying the message you're making if you're an author is very important and I thought they did that really well. It was kind of the yes but um, kind of analysis here, not to discredit that there's small volume disease that was still being seen and overdiagnosed, but to kind of clearly say don't lose sight of this other signal. Um, and in this case, I think the figures here were really critical. So you needed both that large table so that uh, people like myself or you can read through and really see if you feel it fits with what you're expecting, but I think the figures really put it into perspective. And then as I mentioned, I appreciated a lot as the reader the lengthy discussion to really give it meaning, acknowledge um, kind of the uncertainties, and if this is true, why is it happening, and kind of push that next step, which I'm sure the authors are already thinking about studying in other ways, is my guess. So um, appreciation for allowing me to be the discussant, uh, and congratulations to the authors. Uh, and the thanks for them arising three hours earlier than us uh, in the wee hours of the morning to be a part of this. So I have um, the uh, coming back here to the case presentation and the joy of kind of bringing this to a close. Um, what do we think in terms of this question before making decisions on treatment options? You explain that current research shows. So um, I think A and B are actually both reasonable in the sense that A does suggest that thyroid incidence trends are rising, uh, but the rates of cancer-specific mortality remains low. Low is a qualifier term. You could argue that's not unreasonable, but I think what we wanted to show here is B, that thyroid cancer incidence and thyroid-specific mortality are both rising, which is important to note. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Erkin. Great. I think... Um... You probably, uh, first of all, I want to thank you both. Um, these were really outstanding presentations. And again, thank Angela, as, as did Eric, for um, an incredible amount of work and also for uh, um, agreeing to get up and uh, present. Um, I owe you a Starbucks card here for doing this. So thank you uh, once again. Um, these were both outstanding. So let me, let me just to ask you, one of the big questions I had in reading this was, um, number one, do you expect that, and, and I don't know if this is even feasible, that um, the California registry will um, parse out NIFT-P and how that might influence interpretation of these trends here? Angela, if you could start off with that. Um, you know, the short answer is I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you know, NIFT-P is a relatively newer diagnosis within our thyroid cancer community, right? Um, so we've only sort of faced it in the last couple of years. I think folks, you know, pathologists uh, alike, uh, as well as endocrinologists are sort of still trying to wrap our head around it. You know, when I see a patient, I have a couple that I'm like, mm, do I code them as thyroid cancer in the ICD, you know, section of the, the uh, EPIC or do I not? Do I just say this is a thyroid neoplasm? Um, and so, uh, you know, certainly it's going to take some time for registries, uh, you know, large complex data sets to really catch up um, to those, those, those even small complexities. Um, so I can foresee that over time, um, that, that may uh, be something we can look at. Uh, I certainly think that that would be interesting. Um, and you know, what Dr. Alexander already mentioned is that there, we're starting to see a plateau, right, of the incidence rates for the latter years, sort of coincidental with the publication of the ATA thyroid, uh, thyroid cancer guidelines in 2015. So is that really making an impact? Or, or are we sort of still trying to catch up to um, those guidelines to operate less, to biopsy less, uh, to treat less overall? Um, so maybe we'll come back in 10 years and give you those answers. <laughs> Great, um, terrific. Angela, can you just comment? Um, I was also um, noted the the death rate in those sub-centimeter as well as one to two centimeter um, uh, cancers that were noted on your in the table here. Do you have a, do you wanna comment on that and perhaps give us an explanation or is that, it is what it is? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard, a concept to wrap your head around, but when the data are presented, it's 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 hard to explain any other way. 
um, you know, as Dr. Alexander really eloquently outlined, um, you know, there are going to be inherent problems in coding errors, um, sort of, you know, misclassification of, of tumors and all that sort of stuff. We really try to um, get at the uh, at the crux of the data, cross-checking multiple things. Like, really, does this you know jive with our current clinical practice? Does it really you know reflect what we've seen? Um, and you know, there are other ways that we can even further uh, analyze. We can look at perhaps you know density of zip code, uh, you know, or referral-based zip codes with you know the large academic medical centers. Are they perhaps seeing the bulk of you know these little small cancers that might be more incidentally picked up by other uh, workup? versus not, um, it, it's it's a hard number to wrap your head around, but you know, 4% of, you know, the micropapillaries dying, is is that really true? I, I don't know, I don't know if I have that many in my practice to say that that is a real trend. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious to see what other um, uh, folks uh, on the call have seen themselves. Eric, do you wanna comment on that? You know, I think that's the uncertainty a little bit. I mean, we all know there are a few unique cases where it's a small primary and yet we see big lymph node disease or even potentially distant disease. I mean, the data kind of weirdly show that even for small like centimeter like papillaries, there's about a 1% chance of getting a distant met. Usually it's indolent and it's treatable, but um, that's kind of what keeps us up at night when we move to more hemithyroidectomies. How do you pick up on those kind of things? So um, yeah, but I mean, does that does that fit with six to eight percent that you see in this registry? I don't know. That's a little bit high. Um, you know, the hard part is you want to notice those uncertainties in papers and database analyses like this. You don't want to let them distract, I think, from the real message, which is there's nothing here that has been shown that in any way takes away, I think, what the authors clearly show is uh, a real signal. And so it's a little bit of um, uncertainty questions, but again, I think that it's a very uh, solid analysis from a very solid data set that I think really now poses a question to us as a community as to why is this happening, you know, because then we'll know what to do about it. <clears throat> Great. So so let me ask you the, one of the other really key questions. Um, uh, sitting on the East Coast here and, and, and looking at a California-specific cancer registry, how how unique do you think the population of uh, California is, um, and how generalizable do you think this data is um, as we look across the rest of the country and and internationally? I guess I'll take the question. Um, I was going to make some New York I joke about it being a very New York centric question kind of thing, but uh, okay. You know, I think it's um, I think it's I think it's generalizable. I I think of um, California as a, a very diverse state, uh, and I also think just the sheer numbers. I, I do think it has translatability throughout um, to my practice and my area here, um, or at least I should say it differently. I have no reason to doubt that it would be translatable to my practice on an international uh, stage. I guess my my leading assumption is it would be translatable there as well, though I guess I would bring up um, some thoughts as to are there any unique circumstances or otherwise that I should just take into account as I move beyond the U.S. population. Um, so that's my kind of initial thought on that. You know, that's a really interesting thought. Um, you know, here, I, I think what is potentially unique would be the agricultural um, industry, which is uh, just so widespread in the middle part of the state in Central Valley. Um, as well as, you know, small pockets of um, environmental toxicant factories that have gone on um, for several decades and, you know, sort of are in the midst of being cleaned up, uh, or at least, you know, they're hibernating right now. Uh, but, you know, I, at least in my practice, uh, part of my HPI is asking, where did you grow up? Specifically, what part of the state did you grow up? And really, was it near one of those, you know, hot spots, those centers that we have seen sort of a um, unexplainable rise in all sorts of, that, uh, not just thyroid cancers, but all sorts of cancers. And, you know, we know where those areas are. It's sort of our lingo. <laughs> um, I know what, you know, what, what communities those folks uh, have been uh, exposed to. So it's obviously hard to perform that sort of study. Um, you know, we, uh, in the environmental toxic community, we don't even know how to measure things on this, you know, microscopic, very, very small particulate level, let alone correlate with long-term outcomes, you know, many decades later. Um, so very good questions. Um, and it, are they all playing roles? 
um, sort of unclear. How how are you going to are are you able to take this? I know your one of your area of interest, Angela, is in environmental factors here. Um, do you have ongoing studies looking at specific environmental um, concerns and how they may be affecting the influence here, or is this really more on the speculative level? Yeah, it's sort of what I just you know talked about um, and, and hinted at is that when we talk about um, association studies, epidemiologic studies, uh, you know, looking at environmental exposures, it is just so so tough. Um, not for just the reasons that I um, um, spoke of, but um, you know, we're learning more about um, the the associations, that the type of associations, and they're not sort of the general linear, you know, dose response relationship that we are used to in medicine. It's not like dose A gives you response A and dose B gives you response B. We're sort of, you know, in the environmental toxic community, uh, getting more used to these U-shaped curves, you know, where maybe um, at the very low end of the spectrum, there's more harm, and then the very high end of the spectrum, there's more harm, and right in the middle, it's just right. Um, so, uh, you know, it is so hard. And then you put that on top of literally, there's probably hundreds of thousands of chemicals, um, most of which are untested, <laughs> um, let alone for thyroid cancer risks, that it just creates um, a huge level of complexity. So, uh, you know, beyond sort of epidemiologic studies, sort of association studies based on where you live, you know, what your job is, you know, how many hours a day are you in the field and farming versus, you know, what your health um uh, uh, outcomes are, it's really hard to begin uh, to be, get beyond that, I think, at this point, and probably for the likely future. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, just one personal question. If I wear my N95 mask when I come out to that part of California, am I protected <laughs> here? Uh. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, uh, we were just chatting right before that uh, since March, we haven't stopped our thyroid nodule biopsies. Um, we are still you know, doing our regular job and taking care of our, our, our patients and our vets. Um, we just try to be as comfortable and safe as we can, keep at a distance and hope for the best. So I think one of the questions really is this whole question of screening. And if, if, if screening does lead to overdiagnosis, which it's apparent that it does, is there some other direction that we should take. Um, if we are postulating there is a underlying biology that's leading to an increased mortality rate for thyroid cancer, um, is there some hybrid um, approach that we as a society should be looking at um, with that, uh, with, with this very important point that you um, related to mortality that you've identified here? I'm happy to answer. I think so. Um, you know, I think it it moves us really from the idea that somehow screening has taken on this meaning that that implies checking everyone through some mechanism if they have a nodule or cancer, identifying it, and then also that automatically means doing something about it. And I think you have to disconnect those. I don't have any reason to say to people they should stop getting cross-sectional imaging for all the other illnesses, because there's benefit to that. Um, but I think it's kind of this thoughtfulness that you can do a very good risk assessment, even based on whatever reason the nodule was detected, whether or not that nodule needs to be evaluated now or into the future. And even if it's evaluated and found to be a small cancer, I think we need to be much more, uh, retro, you know, much more alert and um, upfront about whether anything needs to be done other than simply observation and watchful waiting. So it is really pulling back on this kind of automaticity to the system driving itself forward. And, and toward that, uh, one of our uh, participants raised the question, um, should screening only be based on ultrasound? Are there other things that um, could be entered in that perhaps would um, not be identifying these very small tumors that we are, you know, that, that raise the challenge for us in terms of how to affect those? But is there, uh, and I think probably um, Angela was sort of talking, speaking to this with respect to her HPI um, questions, but is there another? Um, direction that we should take in terms of screening other than just purely putting an ultrasound to everyone's neck here? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm happy to um, 
take my shot and then Dr. Young can weigh in as well. I, um, you know, I think the complexity again is getting to, it's a little bit in the terminology. So formally screening would be you take a whole population and you apply one test to really detect it everywhere. And that's not really what's happening. So what we really are dealing with in the thyroid nodule cancer world, especially small volume, is that there are groups that are, uh, we're, we're over detecting it. Uh, we're not universally screening for it. Um, so that's kind of the starting point. The, the, the answer though, I think is yes, once you do detect it via whatever reason, and I don't think we can stop that train necessarily. And again, I'll go back to the fact that much of it is kind of cross-sectional imaging done for other reasons. Um, I do think ultrasound should be done because I think that is by far and away our best ability to risk assess. And it's a relatively cheap and easy test in relative terms compared to what else we could do. But if you do see a low risk, small subcentimeter nodule with you know, ultrasound, then I think you have to really push back and say um, nothing else needs to be done uh, and it can be watched uh, and or not do the biopsy. So that's kind of my thought through that um, process. I would agree, you know, and, and again, it is really important just to point out that, you know, the trends that we see in South Korea are just so different because everyone in the country literally gets thyroid ultrasound um, done on whatever frequency basis to detect a really tiny thyroid cancer, most likely, versus we don't have that here in the United States and we probably will never have that. Um, we, we don't have uh, the type of system and just logistical structure to detect such a low risk, you know, primarily low risk thyroid cancer. Um, and so it really is sort of up to us, our good detective work and our skills, asking folks, you know, good family histories, history of ionizing head and neck radiation, um, you know, other things that would, would really pick out those folks whose, you know, maybe occult thyroid cancers would eventually give them morbidity. Um, and mortality, uh, but you know, are should we be doing that for everybody and you know, looking just for the sake of knowing? Probably not. Um, and I think that as a thyroid cancer community, everybody in all disciplines is in agreement that less is more these days. So it's really finding um, that that right balance between what is less, what is more. Awesome. Our last question, and I'm not sure if it's going to, if it's more of a comment than a question, but interestingly, one of our um, uh, audience raised the uh, observation that the on EPA.gov, uh, California, uh, that 10% of the state ha area has groundwater with a nitrate concentration greater than five milligrams per liter, while the number uh, for New York is three percent. Um, is this meaningful? I mean, and and um, and let me let me defer to Angela to comment on that. You know, um, the chemical that I know a lot more about is perchlorate, which has similar properties as nitrate. Both of them inhibit iodine uptake via the sodium iodide symporter. Um, so there's less iodine availability in the thyroid uh, follicular cell. Um, but there is just so little known about uh, both uh, nitrate as well as thiocyanate compared comparison to perchlorate. Um, on many magnitudes less. Um, so even though we can measure things, uh, we are, you know, drawing from what we know about the perchlorate controversies, um, facing all sorts of uncertainties. Are is the assay what you're measuring uh, accurate? Is um, is it reproducible? Is it diurnal? Is it, um, you know, uh, affected by uh, other sort of synergistic exposures or less affected by. And so getting sort of a, just a solid number that it was X percent detectable is very, you know, just skimming the surface of really what is the major problem. We certainly don't understand a lot of what these environmental toxicants are doing. Just because we can measure them doesn't necessarily mean, uh, first of all, they are correct. And then second of all, that they would be leading to health harms. Terrific. Well, um, thank you once again. We are pushing up against the nine o'clock hour. This has been an awesome, awesome um, educational experience. And uh, both of you um, put in a significant amount of uh, time and effort in preparing for this. So we thank you. Uh, we encourage everybody to uh, do two things. One or three things. One is to um, have uh, any of their colleagues uh, who did not have an opportunity to watch this morning to um, uh, watch for the posting of this, which will be on Monday, so that they can go back and watch the entire hour. We also encourage you to join us again next week, um, next Friday morning. And finally, um, encourage all of you to stay safe.
So thank you once again for, for being a part of this.